Good evening and welcome to the 12th annual Kelly Lecture on Humanity's Future. How wonderful it is to see this theater filled tonight with people who have come out to hear Dennis Kucinich, a man of hope, a man of decency, speak about humanity's future. Uh, the series, this series, the Kelly Lecture on Humanity's Future has brought some great thinkers and visionaries to Santa Barbara, and I think you'll find tonight is no exception. The Kelly Lecture is a, a project of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Uh, the mission of the foundation is to educate and advocate for peace and a world without nuclear weapons and to empower peace leaders. That's what we do day in and day out. We educate and advocate for peace and a world free of nuclear weapons, and we empower peace leaders. Uh, there's 60,000 members of the foundation now around the country, and if you're not already a member, we hope you'll join us and play an active role. You can learn more about the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation uh, at the information table that's set up uh, in the foyer when you go out. Uh, you can also learn more about us online at wagingpeace.org. And in your programs tonight, in the program that each of you receive, there is a white card. If you fill this card out, you can fill it out to become a member. You can fill it out to donate. If you hand it in tonight before you leave, um, you'll be entered into a raffle to receive a signed copy of uh, a book by Dennis Kucinich, The Courage to Survive. It's his autobiography. Um, the lecture series honors Frank K. Kelly, a man whose life spanned the 20th century and spilled over a little bit into the 21st century. He was a science fiction writer, a soldier in World War II, a reporter, a speechwriter for Harry Truman, assistant to the Senate Majority Leader, vice president at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, and a founder and senior vice president at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation for all, about two decades. He was a man of deep faith and strong optimism. He believed that we could build a better future. He believed that everyone deserves a seat at humanity's table and that everyone's voice matters. Tonight's lecturer is Dennis Kucinich. He's been a visionary leader in Congress. He's a man who is principled, passionate, and persevering in his leadership for peace and disarmament. Dennis Kucinich is a man who believes in the power of now. What we do now will, will sow seeds for what will happen in the future. We have the power to bring about change. I want to read you something that Dennis Kucinich has written, something short. He wrote, war is never inevitable. Peace is inevitable if we decide to call it forward. And we call peace forward by our acts, by our commitment, by our words, and by our actions for peace. Peace doesn't happen as a form of magic. It happens because we care, because we speak out, because we join together, and because we work for a more peaceful and decent future. Tonight, Dennis Kucinich will be speaking on restoring hope for America's future through developing a culture of peace. Please join me in welcoming to the stage a great American, a man of hope, and a man of peace, Dennis Kucinich.
Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Santa Barbara. Great to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to David Krieger for the opportunity to come to Santa Barbara in support of the efforts of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Uh, this foundation performs vital work in helping to hold back that nuclear sword of Damocles, which has been positioned over uh, the world ever since the development of the atomic bomb. And while my uh, remarks uh, will not relate directly to the work of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, uh, the efforts to try to abolish nuclear weapons uh, actually are part of the subtext of the discussion of violence in our society, which is uh, what I'm going to proceed to talk about. I, I want to say that it is humbling to be here on the stage of the Lobero Theater. Before I came out here, I had a chance backstage to look at the photos of uh, so many people of accomplishment uh, in, in the arts who have had the opportunity to present before audiences uh, from this stage. And I can, be, because I'm an empath, I can pick up on the energies that, that are here, and your energies as well. Thank you for being here. And I also want to thank all those who were ever on this stage for being here, because I feel their presence. Uh, before we get to the questions and answer period, I want to ask what is likely to be one of the first questions, and that is, where is Elizabeth? Um, my, my wife is on a plane right now to London to meet her mother, where they will proceed to the Berlin Film Festival, where Elizabeth has a film that she will be presenting. It's a film that she produced called G-M-O-O-M-G. -O -O <laughs> um, so she says hello. Uh, I, I heard David r recite the uh, many accomplishments of Frank Kelly and to uh, be invited to give the Kelly lecture is no small matter. And so I uh, decided to take a slightly uh, different approach. Uh, this is not going to be a slam-bang political speech. Uh, this is, I, I've, I've given some thought to the broader concepts that deal with the human condition, violence in our society, and violence which is uh, initiated and authorized by our government. I take you back to um, what I think is one of the greatest films ever made, and that is Stanley Kubrick's classic film, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Just after the majestic opening of Richard Strauss's Also Sprach Zarathustra, a soaring sun splitting the darkness seemingly heralding a new genesis. And next, next a man-ape uses a femur bone to dispatch the leader of another group in order to gain control over a waterhole. It is a simple act of one mammal clubbing, clubbing another to death. It is what Friedrich Nietzsche in his novel, Thus Spake Zarathustra, may have countenanced as, quote, the eternal recurrence of the same, unquote. Yet Kubrick does not leave us stranded on the darkling plain of brute violence, for emotion is admitted. And so exultant the conqueror at the demise of his extant competitor that he flings the femur bone skyward in triumph. And through the match-cut magic of movie-making, the femur tumbles 
end over end, high up into the heavens, where it is transformed into a space station. We surf on Kubrick's monolith into an evolutionary spiral across space and millions of years. Now equipped with high technology, but burdened with the signal responses of our lower limbic system and its embedded fight-flight conflicts, ever ready to take up the electronic cudgel to drive contestants out of water holes or oil holes. Violence is. Its expression, neither regressive nor progressive, it exists as a disconnection from our own divinity, a fall from the heavens, a departure from grace, a descent into the lower circles of that philosophical hell of dichotomous thinking, of us versus them, whoever they are. The invention of the other, the evocation of the out-group, the conjuring of the enemy, our precedents of violence. We hear the siren call. But what makes us answer the toxin of rage clanging in our heads, in our homes, in our cities, and in the world? Could it be the ripping of the moorings of our reality, the anxiety of separation shaking our core, the earthquake beneath our ground of meaning dissecting through our bedrock beliefs when we learned that what we thought was true was indeed false? Peter Berger once wrote that reality is socially constructed and culturally affirmed. But what happens when the sociopathic trumps the authentic? We cannot justify violence, but we must determine its roots. Before Kubrick, before Strauss, there was Zarathustra, or Zoroaster himself. Zoroaster confronted us with this moral proposition, that the central struggle of our existence is the determination of what is true and what is false. The central struggle of our existence is the determination of what is true and what is false. Is it our inability to strive for, to discern, and to receive, and to know truth which binds us to violence? Is what we see what we get? Are we bound to truth-shattering illusions? How do we know what we're told is true? Has the misuse of power in our society so distorted meaning that truth and lies are indistinguishable, or worse, morally relative? These are questions of import in our interpersonal relations. And the consequences of untruth grow geometrically when a major progenitor of perceptions in our society the government stumbles or seeks and practices to mislead. To ponder that question, let's look at another production called 2001. September 11th, 2001. The catastrophe of nearly 3,000 innocent 
souls perishing in waves of hate. That date is burned into our memories of one of the worst days we have ever known. We know the choices which our government made, acting with the tacit consent of we the people, to respond to the 9-11 crimes committed against our nation. But we seldom reflect upon our government's response to 9-11, as though to do so publicly is either impolitic or anti-American. Is it rude to mention that acting upon the color of crime and tragedy of September 11, 2001, we began a descent to officially sanctioned mass murder called war into the lower circles of the infernos of torture, rendition, and drone assassination that we established an anti-democratic state of emergency which exists to this day with its Orwellian Patriot Act, its massive spying networks, its illegal detention, its extreme punishment of whistleblowers, its neo-police state, in violation of posse comitatus, which put MPs on the streets of Washington, D.C., during the recent inaugural. We have cut and pasted the Constitution of the United States in the manner of a disambiguated word document through sheer casuistry, excising those sections which guarantee protection from unreasonable search and seizure, which protect individual rights of habeas corpus, due process, which prohibit anyone from simultaneously being policeman, prosecutor, judge, jury, executioner, and coroner. Violence, violence has enabled the government to grow and the republic to shrink. It will be 10 years ago this, or next month, that the United States, despite a massive peace movement that put millions in the street protesting the upcoming attack, that our nation launched a full-scale attack on the nation of Iraq. Shock and awe, it was called. Hellfire was brought into the cradle of civilization. to its people, its culture, its antiquities, in our name, for a war based on lies. In awe of our weapons, we shocked ourselves vicariously with their effects, never experiencing the horror visited upon the people of Iraq. Now, now, when I say we, I, I'm, I mean all morally conscious Americans. Over a million Iraqis were killed in our name. I want to say that again. Over one million Iraqis were killed in our name for a war based on lies. In awe of our destructive power and its toll on innocent human life, we shocked ourselves and then return to our normal lives. Trillions of dollars of damage was done to that country in our name for a war based on lies. Trillions more spent by US taxpayers for a war based on lies. 
in awe of the monetary cost of war, we shocked ourselves with massive deficits. Thousands of U.S. troops were killed, tens of thousands wounded, in awe of the long-term cost of war, the human cost of war. We shocked ourselves with broken lives, broken families, suicides, PTSD. Shock and awe, indeed. We attacked a nation which did not attack us and which had neither the capability nor the intention of doing so. We attacked a nation which did not have the yellow cake to be processed into the substance fit for a nuclear warhead. We attacked a nation which did not have weapons of mass destruction. We visited upon the people of Iraq the equivalent of one 9-11 a day for an entire year. And with it, the irretrievable rending of families, of places to live, places to work, places to worship, ripping apart Iraq society in a war which soon became so remote that it was finished off by unmanned vehicles. The mission that was accomplished was wanton destruction, ecocide, alienation, statecraft, puppetry. And for what? What was it all about? It did not make us any safer. It weakened our military. It killed and injured our soldiers. It seriously weakened our nation financially. This long-term cost of the post-9-11 wars of choice will run over $6 trillion. Is anybody asking one reason why we have a $16 trillion debt? We borrowed money from China, Japan, and South Korea to pursue these wars while those countries built their economy and their infrastructure. We blew up bridges in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan at such expense that we are now preaching austerity here at home unwilling to face the fact that America has over $2 trillion in infrastructure needs, which have not been met. Unwilling to invest in America, all too willing to invest in wars. We became the policemen of the world and ended up being resented worldwide. We have fueled the fires of reactionary nationalism abroad, which are easily stoked by foreign occupation or invasion. We've helped further fundamentalism and made decisions which placed in positions of power those whose very existence supposedly drove us to the conflict in the first place. What passes for our recent history is an acculturated, sleep-inducing lie from which we must wake up. We must awake from the stupor of our self-imposed amnesia or shock. We must shake off the awe which comes from the misuse of power on a global basis. We must always question governments whose legitimacy rests not upon accountability and truth, but upon force and deception. A government which assumes that we are neither intelligent enough nor loyal enough to know the truth about its actions a dozen years ago or for that matter, a dozen days ago, is not worthy of a free people. 
we must bend the fear-forged bars which imprison the truth. We must seek the truth, and we must know the truth, for it is the truth that truly will set us free and lead to the wisdom which can rescue us from destruction, the wisdom that can reclaim America. 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 The mere utterance of the word America should set the pulse pounding with the excitement of discovery, of possibility, of love, not fear. The time has come for us to demand that, uh, that our nation, America, establish and fully empower a commission on truth and reconciliation so that those who are responsible for misleading us into the annihilation of the innocent people in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and elsewhere be brought forward to a public accountability in a formal process of fact-finding, of inquiry, of public testimony, of admission, of confession. This is a process that has worked in other countries, notably South Africa. Frankly, there is no other way out of this moral cul-de-sac in which resides the monstrous crimes of mass murder, torture, kidnapping, rendition, other than to have an atonement, an at-one-ment. It is in at-one-ment, atonement, that we will achieve what Blake called the unity of opposites. It is in reconciliation that the Blakean idea of the contrary nature of God containing multitudes of humanity causes us to understand the fragility of our social compact and the possibility that any one of us could be murderers or victims. Lacking public expiation over the unbridled use of force, the wanton violence we have writ large across the world will replicate it will perpetuate and it will be our ruin. This is the importance of a formal process of truth and reconciliation. Now, we had and we have a right to defend ourselves as a nation. But we were taken on the offense and the violence that we visited abroad will inevitably blow back home. The violence we create in the world in turn licenses and desensitizes the display of wanton violence which is exercised in our streets and unfortunately in our homes. We have to understand the causal links. What is outermost presses down upon what is innermost and what is innermost becomes outermost. Once a full process of truth and reconciliation helps us to discern the truth of our experience in the past decade, equipped with the truth of our errant descent into errant wars, we must be prepared to forgive those who would be forgiven and forgive ourselves for having participated with either our assent or our silence. Then we may move forward with truth as the standard under which we organize a stronger and better America. We must think often of our nation. Reimagine it. Reestablish it as the exemplification of our highest ideals. Think of those lofty sentiments present at the founding of our nation, of its spiritual origins, 
one motto, the Latin words, honorit chaptus. He has favored our undertaking and illusion to the guidance of providence. Think of the transcendent purpose in the founding of America, United States, presaging human unity. Our first motto, E Pluribus Unum, Latin, out of many, one. The paradox of multiplicity in singularity. What extraordinary faith, courage, and spirit was present at the founding of this country. Let us renew our faith in our nation. Let us unite so that the power of unity will lift this nation we love. Let us declare our faith again in each other. As it occurred so many years ago, with that clarion call for the right, we the people. Let us find that place where the capacity Find that place in ourselves where the capacity to evolve catalyzes the evolving character of America. Where through the highest expression of informed citizenship, we quicken the highest expression of informed nationhood. America, America for Americans, America for the world. Let the truth be our empire, the plowshare our sword, nature our textbook, and let us once again celebrate the deeper meaning of what it means to be an America. Then, reimagining the town hall motto, that model where people get together and they talk about things that concern them. Let us consider what America represented to each of us on the day before 9-11, on September 10th, 2001. Let millions of people in tens of thousands of places across our nation meet, rediscover, and celebrate our nation and its purpose and recapture the spirit of America which we know already resides in countless places, the spirit of America is always ready to be called forward with a sense of wonder and joy, which our children will in time come to understand as our capacity to rise from the ashes of our own suffering and disillusionment, a quality which becomes their civic inheritance. Well, we were founded with the idea of striving for per perfection, we were not a perfect nation by any means before 9-11. But I remember a, a greater sense of optimism, a greater sense of freedom, of security, of control of our destiny. We need to come together now in town halls across America to appreciate our common experiences, to share our narratives about what's best in our nation about what we love about this country, about our own journeys and those experiences in our own lives which connect us to the possibilities which underpin that dream that we can call America. To share with each other those things in our lives that directly connect us to what we call the American dream. And when we come together in that way, when we so share, we will know each other better and have 
even more love for our country. Violence of today has cast us into a psychological wilderness. There is a path out of the wilderness of violence in which so many of our fellow countrymen and countrywomen are lost. If we are to help them find that path, it would be helpful for us to look again at the origins of our nation and find the map. July 4th, 1776, the Second Continental Congress unanimously declared the independence of 13 colonies and the achievement of peace was recognized as one of the highest duties of the new organization of free and independent states. Peace at the founding. Yes, the paradox of revolutionary war, but the destination was peace, articulated and enshrined. The drafters of the Declaration of Independence appealed to the supreme judge of the world and derived the creative cause of nationhood from the laws of nature and the entitlements of nature's God celebrating the unity of human thought, natural law, and spiritual causation in declaring we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The architects of independence, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, spoke to the activity of a higher power which moves to guide the nation's fortunes and lends its divine spark to infuse principle into the structure of democratic governance. The Constitution of the United States, in its preamble, further sets forth the insurance of the cause of peace in stating, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. We must remember where we have been so we can chart to where we will proceed. It is the sacred duty of the people of the United States to receive the living truths of our founding documents and to think anew, to develop institutions which permit the unfolding of the highest moral principles in the nation and around the world. Some of these words that I just shared with you are from the preamble of legislation that I wrote in 2001. They form the basis of my understanding of the conceptive power of freedom. The founders of this country gave America a vision for the ages and provided people with a document that gave this nation the ability to adapt to an undreamed of future. What can we give back? When I first came to Congress, I saw how easily we slipped into conflict. I saw how, saw how normally placid representatives could get swept up by war fever. It led me to study war. I learned that during the course of the 20th century, more than 100 million people perished in war, most of them innocent noncombatants. And here today, violence is the overarching theme of our time encompassing personal, group, national, and international conflict, extending to the production of nuclear, biological, chemical weapons of mass destruction, which have been developed for use on land, air, sea, and space. Such conflict is taken 
as a reflection of the human condition without questioning whether or not the structures of thought, word, and deed which we have inherited are any longer sufficient for the maintenance, growth, and survival of our nation and the world. Personal violence in the United States has great human and financial costs, costing hundreds of billions of dollars annually, not including war-related costs. Child abuse and neglect costs over $100 billion annually. But we are still relatively at the beginning of a new millennium, and the time has come to review old age-old challenges with new thinking, wherein we can conceive of peace as not simply being the absence of violence, but the active presence of the capacity for a higher evolution of human awareness, of respect, trust, integrity, where we all may tap the infinite capabilities of humanity to transform consciousness and conditions which impel or compel violence as a personal group, uh, at a personal group or national level. We do this towards developing a new understanding of and commitment to compassion and love in order to create a shining city on a hill, the light, which is the light of nations. It was this thinking, this articulation, which I was privileged to bring forth on July the 11th, 2001, fully two months before 9-11, to introduce a bill, H.R. 808, to create a cabinet-level Department of Peace, soon to be reintroduced by Congresswoman Barbara Lee as the Department of Peace building. Imagine coming from a position of love for our country and for, and for each other. If we move forward without judgment to meet the promise of a more perfect union by meeting the challenge of violence in our homes, our streets, our schools, our places of work and worship, to meet the challenge of violence in our society through the creation of a new structure which can directly address domestic violence, spousal abuse, child abuse, violence in the schools, gang violence, gun violence, racial violence, violence against gays. This goes much deeper than legislation which forbids certain conduct, it goes much deeper than creating systems to deal with and to help victims. Those things are necessary, but they're not sufficient. We need to go deeper if we are, at last, to shed the yoke of violence which we carry through our daily lives. And so then we speak of creating a structure where all across this country we tap the creative energies of those who have committed themselves, the sociologists, the psychologists, the counselors, who commit themselves to help people through their daily lives. Across the country, we begin to transform our educational system to teach children peace-giving, peace-sharing, mutuality, to look at the other person as an aspect of oneself. We know violence is a learned response, so is nonviolence. We must replace a culture of violence with a culture of peace. Not through the antithetical use of force, not through endless thou shalt nots, and not through mere punishment, but, but through tapping our higher potential to teach principles of peace building and peace sharing, and to teach them at the earliest ages as part of a civic education in a democratic society. Carl Rogers, 
the humanistic psychologist has written, and I quote, the behavior of the human organism may be determined by the external influences to which it has been exposed, but it may also be determined by the creative and integrative insight of the organism itself. We are not victims of the world we see. We become victims of the way we see the world. If we are prepared to confidently call forth a new America, if we have the courage to not simply re-describe America, but to reclaim it, we will once again fall in love with the light which so many years ago shined through the darkness of human existence to announce the birth of a new nation. Out in the void, I can see a soaring sun splitting the darkness. Behold, the dawn of a new nation, our beloved America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Appreciate that. And we're going to go to questions. Two words, positive vision. Um, it's been a whole generation at least. It's been a whole generation at least since people got out in the streets, not just against war and so on, but a positive vision. We have tens of millions of people out of work while we need to build the future for sustainable energy and sustainable transportation. Why are we not calling for people to get out in the streets for a positive vision? The potential of being able to move a new agenda in this country for economic justice is unlimited if we regain the civic capacity for action, if we are willing to be visible. Uh, one, and this is really one of the great preconditions for being able to uh, create change uh, in Washington. It's to become visible. And when you do it in mass, it has impact. There's just no question about it. But lacking visibility, uh, it's very hard to have to rely on the um, uh, built-in inertia, which tends to characterize uh, activities within the, the beltway. So, specifically, I introduced legislation in the United States Congress, H.R. 2990, called the National uh, Employment Emergency Defense Act. And the whole idea is to create millions of jobs rebuilding our infrastructure. Now, people will say, well, where's the money coming from? Keep in mind, we borrowed hundreds of millions of dollars from, from China, uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, to finance wars. We, we pay interest on that debt. We have a trade deficit with China that is about $200 billion. We, China, Japan, is, they're reinvesting in their country. We're not doing that. We have the power under the Constitution, Article I, Section 8, to coin or create money. It's an inherent power of the government that was written into the Constitution specifically so we wouldn't be in hock to the banks. A series of presidents warned against that. In 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was written, and what happened is that it took over the money power. So the government then was at the threshold, you know, you pass an income tax, you fund the government, but actually what happened is it imposed on the people a greater responsibility for coming up with the resources for governance instead of recognizing that the innate power to put money into circulation rested with the government. Instead, what do we have? Money is debt. The whole system is upside down. So this is, you talk about, you start thinking about money and how a different concept of money could start to change things. We have the power right now to get our way out of this, these doldrums, to put America back to work, 
to reject austerity as a way of life and to stop the raid on Social Security and any of the other programs. So, you know, this is something, you're right, and it ought to be, it, you know, uh, social justice and economics are, uh, uh, are, are twins in the same march here. Thank you for your question. I've been an activist for, since I was a kid in high school and uh, ran for president. Got involved in uh, college in, uh, in politics and uh, over the years I've seen you speak since uh, 2000 and during the Bush escalation to go to war in two different countries. And I'm just wondering, you, you haven't appeared to have much influence as maybe one of 12 to 14 congressmen there in Washington, D.C., who makes incredible words happen like you do. I mean, they're inspirational. I'm sure everybody feels that way in this room tonight. I'd like to speak about apathy for a second because I, I've seen it my whole life. And when Bush decided that he was going to go to war in 2003, he did it on my birthday, and I, I just couldn't believe how angry I was that we were going to war against a country that, that was not invading us. And it was Raymond Burke who said that if, if evil were to prevail, and I don't like the word evil, but if evil were to prevail, it would only take enough good men to do nothing. And I have seen a lot of people in this country do absolutely nothing compared to what we've needed to move the kind of consciousness that you're talking about moving tonight. Could I, could I uh, respond to yeah, that? Yeah, sure. Sorry. No, that's, look, at it. it's, it's an important point that you made. Um, I mentioned in my prepared remarks, you know, there, there's a sense in which we have to forgive ourselves. Um, this is about all of us, not just one of us. And um, the, we can look back over 10 years, and it's pretty shocking. I mean, if you were to go home tonight and Google uh, Kucinich, October 2002, analysis of uh, the Iraq War Resolution, uh, you'll see, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not a swami. I, can, I, I picked it up right away what was going on. And anybody who really spent the time would understand what was going on. But we were pushed into this war, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of dead people as a result. I can't get that out of my head. I, I, and to me, our nation needs to, how do we get beyond it? This is, I, I really am concerned that if we just bury this whole discussion about what happened in Iraq, and Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and there's a few other places. We're never going to, we're never going to recover the, the country. We'll, we'll be dragged into more wars. We, we've got to stop uh, the beat. And, and what I've learned about being out of Congress a month now is, is a very valuable lesson, and it relates to the question you asked. There is an exaggerated pace of activity and, a, and an inflated sense of importance to things that happen in Washington. It's not the real pace of life. It's, ex it's exaggerated. And to become in tune with the slower rhythms of life, to be able to watch things grow, to be able to you know, understand the loving relationships and to just slow everything down, helps one to be able to understand that what we're trying to do is not just preserve this, this structure we call a nation, we're trying to preserve the lives of the people in the nation and the lives of the people in the whole world. Next question. Thank you. Dennis, first of all, thank you for your years of service to our country. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you. Um, I have a friend who is uh, talking to his congressman and is a, a Democrat, and his congressman said he didn't go to Democratic caucus meetings. Uh, because all they do is ask for money, which was a surprising. Comment. I mean, that's true. <laughs> well, they, no, they don't. That well, it's only partially true. Let me tell you the whole truth. Uh, they talk about polls, how bad Republicans are, and they talk about money. So they talk about three things. Okay, so what follows? Well, th that even gives me less hope 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, but it, it seems that party politics really uh, prevents any real change from happening. Do you see any pathway out of party politics? Well, it, it, look, when you have over 10 million people who have lost their homes or their homes are still in jeopardy, when you have you know, nine point, well, when you have unemployment with about 10 million people who are out of work, when you have people who have lost their investments and people are worried about their retirement security and children who can't go to good schools, and when you have a country that's still spending a lot of money in war and they're still on a spy infrastructure, let me tell you something. The two-party system works when the practical aspirations of the American people are met. And when the part, when the, the practical aspirations for, for work, for help for small business, to move the economy, for education, for health care, and all those other things, when they are not addressed, then the two-party system is held in question. I would submit that we're at a time right now where there are justly serious questions about the legitimacy of the two-party system. I mean, you know, um, You know, I, I'm, I'm a Democrat, but when I, you know, when I would go into those meetings infrequently, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't put my principles on the door. I, I, okay, you know, in the spirit of the confession, which I'm advocating in my remarks, um, <laughs> I hadn't gone, I, I stopped going to the meetings, okay? <laughs> Here I am, a lapsed Democrat. But I stopped going to the meetings. <laughs> and then, then in a moment of, uh, I'm going to go today. I stopped going to the meetings because all they were talking about was money and polls and, and beating up Republicans. So finally, a year passed. And I just said, you know, I think I'm going to go back. and Maybe I can do something in, in this meeting today. I don't know. So I, I walked in the door and what were they talking about? <laughs> Money in polls and beating up Republicans. I'm out of here, right? So, look, there are limitations to this system, and we're seeing them. And um, 2016, if we don't see some changes and things move forward, you know, we could see a, a challenge. And I think it's important that we, that we start to look to more of a multi-party approach because there's a lot of, um, of, of important issues that get swept aside through the uh, you know, backroom deals or, uh, or the convenience of uh, two political parties. So you know, we, we may be at the threshold of a real shakeup in, in the political system, and frankly, that's not all that bad. OK, thank you. Good okay. question. Yes. Hi, Dennis. Hi. Oh, holy cow. Hi. Hi. Um, I believe I can speak for all of us here and saying that we wholeheartedly love you and appreciate you oh. so dearly. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have two questions for you. One of them is, how best can we support your vision, which is our vision, in both the micro of our own lives and the macro of government and the world? And how best can we support the Department of Peace? Well, uh, the, let me take the second part first. Um, Barbara Lee, who I will be with in Oakland on, um, uh, on in two days. Uh, before I left Congress, we had many long talks, and she agreed to uh, take that baton and keep running with it. And we made some changes to the legislation. It'll emphasize peace building, an, an active capacity, which is really good. Uh, in, and I think that it would be helpful for uh, whatever congressional district you're from to ask a member to sign on to the bill. But it also would be helpful, given what an extraordinary community this is, to create, for, to create a, a forum where you could talk about some of the practical applications of this. Keep in mind that, you know, the, the, there is a legitimate concern that, yeah, what this country needs is a bigger government, right? 
But what, what we're talking about here is actually a transformative purpose. To, to, we, we need to get in, in the discussion. This is the problem. You know, when you create a department, it creates, it legitimatizes the discussion about justice, about, about labor, about, you know, the environment, about uh, health. And, and peace is, is seen like back here. It's almost like it's a merry fairy notion instead of central to our existence and, and our continuation as a species. So, you know, I, um, you know, I, I would, remember, I introduced this 2001 in July, and, you know, the eyes were, I saw I, people's eyes were rolling, you know, yeah, right, another department, bigger government. Hey, wait a minute. If we're spending half of our budget on the implements of war and preparing for war, what if we spent just a couple percentage points on trying to create peace? Uh, how about a, you know, there's, there are financial issues here as well, not just moral issues. And you can, you can come at it from the practicalities and with all the shootings that are happening around the country, you know, a lot more attention is paid to it. We need to get on, you know, we need to get underneath that and talk about what's happening. You know, why is our society becoming so unhinged? And, you know, guns are one thing that, you know, people use in implement of violence. But even if they pass an assault weapons ban, which I, of course, would vote for, we're still stuck with the fact that there are 100 million, according to, you know, many different reports, gun owners in the country. Now, that's something we got to be aware of. You can't ignore it. And there's 300 million guns. So the question deals, the urgent question deals with the issues of violence in a society. And that's, and that's what we've got to create the discussion of. And when you've got our government blowing up people all over the world and trying to make it legal, we're not in a very good position to tell Americans that they shouldn't, you know, have their own gun for their own ride. So, you know, there, there, is, there is an element of hypocrisy here which damages our ability to have some influence over the public discourse. So now, as far as myself, uh, let me just give you a quick update. We'll go to the next uh, question. Uh, I am, um, uh, you know, like uh, one month out of Congress. I haven't had to go to any congressman uh, anonymous meetings. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I really, I really recaptured uh, a, a sense of joy, which is part of my innate uh, being, and and it's and it's all good. It's really all good, and I've, uh, you know, really thank you. <laughs> Great to be here in Santa Barbara, where. The sun shines. And um, the other thing is I'm working, I'm working on a book that's been a very long project that I've put off, but I'm back to. And, you know, it'll, it, when I, I, years ago in another incarnation, I was mayor of the city of Cleveland 35 years ago. I can't even believe it, but, you know, I was six or something. And, um, <laughs> but, but, but I'm writing this story about a young mayor who took on the, uh, the mob and uh, corporate uh, skullduggery and somehow almost survived, and, um, and uh, you'll hear about that in a year. And then I'm on a speaking tour of sorts, and I'm um, doing TV. I know people saying, why are you on Fox? Okay, you can say collectively, why are you on Fox? Look, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna take that right. Well, here's, here's the thing. You know, I can go and preach to the choir. That's easy, but, but, my philosophy is that if you are going to try to change people's thinking, then you talk to people who don't agree with you. Um, and, and I have, uh, and, and in that way I've found a home. <laughs> so, next, next question. Mr. Kucinich, thanks for being here. Please bear with me because I have more than a small fear of public speaking, but I'm going to try. Uh, I am an activist and a student, and given the absurd degree that corporate money pollutes our government, I'm looking for ways to behave politically outside of the established avenues. I'm wondering, I was glad to hear you use the term ecocide. I'm wondering if you could comment on the burgeoning student divestment from fossil fuel movement and the renormalization of the student divestment from fossil fuel movement and the renormalization of civil disobedience 
evidenced by the Tar Sands Blockade, 350.org, and the Sierra Club's commitment to a nonviolent direct action for the first time in its 120-year history. Uh, let, thank you for the, you see the response here. The, the, the public is ready for a more active approach in confronting the destruction of our planet, the destruction of the natural world. Uh, it was Thomas Berry, the late uh, philosopher, uh, who said that uh, the major work of our life should be a reconciliation with the, with the natural world. And we've seen this natural world being cartelized, being auctioned off. And so uh, the work that 350.org, the Sierra Club, and others are doing is absolutely important. It's about a type of civic action that uh, is our responsibility of, of, of citizenship. Uh, now, as far as the, the money aspect, look, Washington, the, the, after Buckley versus Vallejo, uh, you know, which basically said that money is, equals free speech, and Citizens United, which gave corporations the ability to, um, to contribute uh, corporate dollars into federal campaigns, what's happened is the whole thing's an auction. And, and the candidates that, that are often brought forward are the candidates who you know, went to the highest bidder. Now, does that mean they're all crooks? Absolutely not. It means that the system is a rotten system, and, and, and if we're going to free our country from this, from this stigma of, uh, of pay to play, the only way we can do it is a constitutional amendment that would stop all private funding of elections once and for all. Private funding, private ownership of the process, public funding, the chance that we might actually have our government back. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, I just wanted to uh, actually reiterate the question that was asked earlier about party politics. Um, Bush's crimes have become Obama's crimes, and at this point, the only person who was faced with prison time for uh, torture was a whistleblower. Right. So at what point, at what point do we stop, do give up on democratic politics and seek a third option? Well, I think that's part of the discussion that's going to happen in the next few years, depending on, you know, the direction that, that we go, you know, that we go in. I, you know, if people see whistleblowers punished and people see uh, those who, who perpetuated uh, crimes against uh, others, and uh, then they're going to ask the questions. That's why what I advocate is to look at South Africa's experience, uh, uh, look at other nations that have had a process of truth and reconciliation. We need to bring the whole range of of the top decision makers in to explain what happened. And if they, if, I mean, we're a democracy. You know, just because you held a high office doesn't mean all of a sudden you're, you're unaccountable. We, we need to do that to save our country. And it's not about putting anybody in jail. It's about the truth, which has a much greater value than imprisonment. We need to know the truth. So I, yes, I'd like to see President Bush and Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld and all of them brought in to ask, you know. And it's about loving, it's about loving our country. That's what it's about. How much do we love America? Yes, hi. I'm, hello. I'm curious how you found the courage to do what you do. What was your experience in Congress being the David of peace up against the Goliath of our violent culture every day? Uh -huh. Can you tell us a little bit, something more personal? Uh, there's a, a film director here by the name of uh, Andy Davis. Are you here somewhere? Okay, yeah. We, we were talking earlier. He's from Chicago, and you know I'm from Cleveland, and and Cleveland's like a, li a little Chicago, and uh, where, where I grew up and the neighborhoods I grew up in, which are a lot of different neighborhoods, because my parents kept moving around. By the time I was 17, we lived in 21 different places, including a couple cars. So we're always, we're already always new in the neighborhood. Okay. You know, when you're new in the neighborhood, you're kind of a stranger, and it's like, hey, <laughs> welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> um, so what happened is, it's true. I learned a physical courage. Uh, my problem was that I wasn't tall enough to be able to use it often, but, <laughs> but, 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 I learned, but I did learn a physical courage. So when I got into uh, these contests later on in life, where people would try to throw around their title or their position or their power. I, I was never impressed by that. Because once you, once you can walk the streets of a neighborhood where people tend to get beat up, 
uh, and you get through it, you run the gauntlet, and after a while, you know, you start to feel pretty good, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> till, uh, till, till a dog came around uh, along and tore the only pair of pants that I owned. That, <laughs> but that, that, that physical courage is something that really helped me later on in life. I didn't know what I was preparing for, and I'm still not sure, but, uh, but that's part of it, really. So how did I do it? It just, that's what I brought. That's from Cleveland. I owe that to Cleveland. Yeah. OK, uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, forgive me for making two very brief, asking two very brief questions. The first is, I, I agreed thoroughly with your point that an uh, investigation into the truth behind the Afghani and Iraq wars would be an exercise of healing for us as the country, and I'm wondering how you feel about the potential exercise of an investigation to the truth of the events of 9-11 and the possibility um, that our government was intimately involved. I spent a lot of time looking at this myself. And, and what we have is a level of distrust of government generally that w was so severe during that time that it raised all kinds of questions. And, and I, I don't think that we can even get to that point until we have people are ready to come forward about the decisions they made and start to build the confidence in the government in the process again. It's really a measure of the distrust of government. That, and, and I'm not going to judge the science that I've read about and I've read thousands of pages of documents about it. Uh, look, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But I know one thing, until we repair uh, the trust between the people and, and, uh, and the government, it's going to be very difficult to get people to agree on anything about it. But I mean, I'm open to further exploring it, but I've, I, I, you can't just say, well, we're going to look at that when you have a, a, these other issues that are really, that you, where you can prove that wrong, you know, wrong actions were taken. So I, I think that's still an open question, and I, I don't know the answers to it. But I, but I respect those who have not, uh, who have not quit asking. Um, I, too, am more or less a recovering Democrat. Um, I love your analogy to the femur bone. I feel that drones are the next manifestation of that femur bone. Um, mm. And in that light, uh, there's a group of us in uh, Ventura County who are putting together a Drones the Dark Side conference. And I believe that this is where we can finally get active before the regulations are made. Um, I'm actually running a, for the assembly against the Prince of Drones, um, a, a assemblyman who is having, who is lobbying to bring drones to Ventura County. He says they can be the salvation of the economic and jobs crisis in Ventura County. Okay. So well, anyway, so I'm so glad you mentioned drones. I know that's one of your issues. So do you think that we finally have a chance if we get ahead of the game that we can really use this to maybe make a difference? Well, the, the mechanized warfare, the robot, you know, war by robots, uh, robot planes, whatever, it, it, what it does is it removes, it removes us from... Um, our humanity, it, it separates us from actually having to make decisions, um, and, and, it, and it, it, it sets us on a path, of uh, an inconscient path, further going deeper into the darkness of, um, of, of hate and a, and, a, and a loss of humanity. Uh, I saw this when I first heard about it uh, back in 2007 when I wedding, or 2005, when a wedding party was blown up in, in, in Pakistan with a drone strike. We, we, we have to watch this, and I, and I will tell you this, that the administration's description, people, you get a chance, look at the 16-page uh, legal uh, memo, which came out of the Department of Justice. Um, I, you know, I, I, I didn't go to law school. I play a lawyer on TV occasionally. Um, <laughs> But I, but I will tell you this, I don't know if, if they have a class in pretzel making at Harvard Law where they twist the Constitution into a pretzel so you're supposed to understand it, but, but that, that whole memo is an exercise 
in, in, in casuistry and sophistry, having no connection to, to any solid bedrock constitutional principles. The, the use of these drones shreds the Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable search and seizure, Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment with respect to due process. Look, I'm all over this. We could spend the rest of the evening talking about it, but we need to fight back on that and push back. And, and that, that cannot be who we are as Americans. We cannot permit our country to wage war without any accountability, assassinate people, whoever we want, baloney. Yes. I caught your recent Pacifica Radio uh, interview, and I'm glad you're enjoying your independence and decompressing, smelling the roses, all that. When the time comes, in California here, we have a US senator who's been here for a while, and she's uh, uh, moving more and more year by year, more and more right. That's Diane Feinstein. What will it take for you to establish residency here <laughs> and run against Check, her? please. No. Here, listen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, OK, do I love California? Yes. But here's the thing. If you want to be, if you want to, if you love California, then you, you're in Congress, and then you've got to be in Washington. You can't be in California. So I don't know. I mean, thank you. <laughs> God bless America. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. All right, thank you for your uh, inspirational speech, and uh, you've been my hero in politics ever since I started following politics. And um, I'm an inventor and entrepreneur who's trying to start jobs in uh, clean energy, so how can people like me get the $500 mil billion dollars that's put into war and put that to where it needs to be put to rebuilding our energy infrastructure and providing jobs. This is the whole question about resources. I mean, when you think about it, uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz uh, wrote a book. The title of it was The $3 trillion war. He and Linda Bilmes, his associate, uh, they, they updated it to say $5 trillion war. Uh, imagine for a moment, and we can do this, imagine for a moment that instead of investing in war that we had invested in and, you know, carbon-free energy technology. Uh, you know, I, I mean, we, we would have we been energy independent. And so, um, the, the other thing is this. We have to, we, and maybe some time in the future, David, to come back here, I want to, this idea of, of the National Employment Emergency Defense Act. We have the ability to be able to use our resources right now to invest in the creation of, of alternative energies, and we should be doing that. Instead of our reliance on, on coal, on nuclear, uh, and oil, we, cannot, we can no longer do that. It's, it, it's apart from our natural world. And, and the world, you know, Mother Nature doesn't make deals with politicians. <laughs> I mean, really, you know? She, Mother Nature just responds in a very powerful way to the assaults on, 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 her, on her planet. So we, um, we need to invest in that. And it's part of the cycle of job creation. So thank you, and stay with that, because it, that, that time is coming. I, I want to say this as I, thank you. I want to say this as I uh, wrap this up. I, I, I put together a, um, a website, uh, kucinichaction.com. And if you sign up, uh, I'm, as I make my transit a, a, away from uh, the electoral side, uh, I'm, uh, everyone who signs up there will be in touch, and I'll kind of keep you posted on a monthly basis about what I think's going on, you know, I don't always know myself, but I'll. Uh, but I, I'd, I'd like to ask you if you have a chance to sign up at, at CasinoJaction.com. Um, David, I, I, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to uh, be here at Libero in Santa, uh, Santa Barbara for this uh, very important uh, forum. Um, I love doing this, and I have to tell you that just being here tonight has been such a joy. Thank you for your time, for, for your commitment to America. Let's love our country and reclaim it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, David. I, thank you all. Thank you for being here. I think, I think Frank Kelly would have been a very happy man tonight. So, wonderful evening, thank you all.